مساء الخير اهلا وسهلا فيكو باسم مركز كارنيجي للشرق الاوسط برحب ب سادة الحضور لمشاركتنا الندوة هذا المساء مع نهاية هذا الأسبوع والمتعلقة باستعراض تقرير تم إعداده من قبل مجموعة من منظمات الأمم المتحدة ولكن قادتها عمليا انترناشنال أو منظمة العمل الدولية وبرنامج الأمم المتحدة الإنمائي تقرير ربما يتساءل البعض يعني ما الجديد في هذا التقرير في في هذه الفترة التقرير يستعرض عمليا محددات التنمية الجديدة أو يعني مقاربة تنموية جديدة مقاربة تنموية جديدة في ظل الربيع العربي و في ظل او يعني I would like to switch to English since I prepared my notes and for the benefit of all the audience this report is an outcome of joint effort by the secret by the ILO UNDP and I know that ISCO has contributed as well to this report and other United Nations organizations and it provides a quick historic review uh, of the uh, economic uh, changes that took place since 1990s in the region and the goal actually was to analyze what has happened over the past two decades and to provide some lessons and policy orientations for the policy makers in the Arab countries the report also um, emphasized the fact that growth is important and achieving the highest growth is also important but also it pays attention to the quality of the growth and from that it correlates economic changes that took place and the Arab uprising or the Arab Spring in the region trying not to establish causality but also to uh, identify strength, weakness and what has happened basically the uh, central theme or the message that something has changed over the last two years or since the Arab uprisings erupted and that is what is also emphasized in the report is that the voice now there is a voice for the Arab street and also there is also much emphasis on the government accountability in that regard the report also goes on and emphasizes not only demand or it, it emphasizes supply and demand side in the growth rate and in particular in the issues related to the labor market and also distinguish or make the distinctions between short term and long term I will not take long time to sort of present I just wanted to share with you the general outline but also to emphasize few points that the report in its holistic approach has somehow uh, tackled by emphasizing not only sort of the dynamic of the growth but also went into to look into uh, the parameters of what we call now the social justice and how really you can have an integrated framework to achieve growth and this is where the title of the report came it looked into the fiscal structure and the taxation structure and whether that was progressive regressive and to what extent that contributed to the trickle down effect and to target certain groups it looked into the monetary policy it looks into the exchange rate and provided some uh, guidance in, in the sense of while targeting inflation what would have or what happened to the other groups looking at the exchange rate and the appreciated currency or otherwise and how that influenced the importation or the to encourage incentivize import also tackling issues related to the industrial policy and finally to issues regarding privatization all of this in the context of what can be done the quality of the growth to present this report we will have two speakers 
and we'll have uh, a discussion and uh, as you can see I am introducing and moderating this session to my right is Professor Zaviris Zanatos he is a friend and he is a prominent economist he is now an economist based in the United Arab Emirates and I must also uh, make the notes that both presenters uh, have sort of lift the agencies when, when they were, when they prepared this report. This is actually, it's an upward uh, uh, mobility <laughs> rather than. That applies for Dr. Zaviris and Dr. Khaled to, to my left, uh, whom still in the same paradigm as you can see, they are still passionate about what they wrote, but they moved on. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Zaviris, now he is um, an economist uh, based in the United Arab Emirates, he previously served as a senior advisor at the ILO regional office in Beirut. He served as an advisor to the managing director of, for the World Bank, where he served before. And uh, he was in charge of both the social protection program in the MENA region and the global child labor program. He's a former chair and professor of the economics department at the University of Beirut, uh, American University of Beirut and he also held senior academic and research appointment in Europe. Dr. Khaled Abu Smain is now with working as a senior economist with ESQA, but he previously was with the United Nations Development uh, Program. He previously served as the Poverty and Economic Policy Advisor at the United Nations Development Program Regional Center for Arab States. Abu Smail's work includes close collaboration with other UN agencies in implementing and monitoring pro-poor development policies. And I must admit, knowing Khaled for the last probably 10 years, he's been a strong advocate of a new development approach. Now it is, uh, at least there is a shift in the Arab countries and globally towards what he's been sort of propagating long time ago. And finally, uh, Dr. Sami Atala. Uh, is going to be uh, to provide uh, comments on this report. He is the executive director of the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies. His research focuses on fiscal decentralization and municipal finance, corruption and governance, and industrial policy. Prior to joining LCPS, uh, Atala coordinated a municipal finance study for the Lebanese Ministry of Interior and he uh, wrote extensively uh, on issues related to the Arab economies but also on the Lebanese economy in particular. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Zaviris to provide the general thrust of the report and then uh, Dr. Abu Ismail is going to focus on the issue related to quality of growth and poverty and linking growth with other indicators and then we'll move into uh, the uh, discussions and for you as an audience. Dr. Zavir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ibrahim, and thanks, uh, Carnegie, for hosting the event. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here and also among so many familiar uh, uh, faces and also having the opportunity to thank uh, ILO and my uh, colleague uh, Khaled uh, for contributing and also quite a few of you in the floor that have worked directly or indirectly in this report, starting with our regional director, uh, Nada Nassif, who is sitting right on the front, and we have contributions from UNESCO and, uh, and other agencies. Uh, you summarized a lot of points, so let me kind of move uh, quickly over the introductory chapters. And this report was mandated by the regional uh, Arab uh, UND, UN Development Group uh, in New York uh, soon after the Arab uh, Spring. The idea was that it was a massive event, it was a regional event, and uh, the challenges were great. So the UN, ages, the UN family had to have a coherent, a strategic approach on uh, how it does operation and also how we can give uh, advice to individual countries on what is uh, lying ahead. Uh, as um, uh, it's been mentioned already more than once, uh, this is a collab collaborative effort with all these eight agencies being involved, of course the ILO and the UNDP uh, from Beirut and Cairo led the, this effort, but uh, uh, we couldn't uh, have produced uh, this report without, uh, without their, their support. Huh? Moreover, we had an international and regional advisory committee 
with uh, leading practitioners, uh, uh, academics, researchers, uh, and, uh, and others. So it took us almost uh, a year, I would say, to collect the information and come up uh, with this report. But there are special thanks to all of them who contributed. Uh, the report, and I think there is a copy, starts with a broad uh, economic framework uh, uh, and uh, the so-called reforms since the 1990s that the Arab states uh, have undertaken and what has been the effect at the macro level, which effectively is the major determinants of outcomes in the economy and the society. I mean, it's a little bit like the rating agencies, Moody's and Standards and Poor and uh, Fitch and all these things. Uh, you may have a company in a country that is excellent, but if the country is rated triple C, that company will get a triple C. So examining the macroeconomy and what's happening is the determinant for all other social and economic indicators. So we work on the broad macroeconomic uh, and economic picture, and then we got down into the uh, other dimensions of the economy of the society. So this is the outline of, uh, of the report, and as you said, it is uh, available in summary and uh, also in copies. You are familiar with this, uh, that uh, the 1980s was a lost decade in the Arab world, huh? and uh, the old system, no matter how you describe it, you can uh, say it had the social uh, contract, uh, it was a paternalistic system, it was an autocratic system, <laughs> Uh, it was an Arab socialism, if you want, uh, but it was based very much uh, on uh, kind of uh, limited participation by the citizens uh, in public life, and at the same time, the state was providing a lot of jobs uh, in the form of public uh, sector employment and, uh, and benefits. Uh, by the 1990s, the system came into to a halt. Uh, uh, somehow this doesn't show well on the screen, but doesn't matter. And uh, <coughs> 1981, the oil prices doubled, and the region went into a big recession. In fact, today, per capita incomes in Saudi Arabia are lower than what they were in 1981. Per capita incomes, not the size of the economy. So that started in the 1980s. Uh, uh, the, the debt started increasing. Uh, there was great fiscal stress. Uh, uh, there was no possibilities for expanding more, inflation was rampant, and something had to be done. And what was done was from the 1990s, as we say, depending on the, on the country, for example, Tunisia started opening up uh, in 1989, followed by Egypt, uh, somehow these were the two countries that, uh, that the Arab Spring started, uh, and uh, they undertook a series of pro-market reforms. Here the reports is kind of, not in the middle, but between two extremes. One is that the reforms worked, uh, and uh, all this liberalization and uh, pro-market approach uh, uh, had uh, great effects, uh, to the point that the region uh, was uh, uh, characterized as going through a renaissance, the Arab renaissance, uh, uh, having been through the dark ages of the 1980s and 1990s, the 2000s was really uh, the time to be in the Arab world. Uh, so that was the Panglossian view of the, of the Arab world. On the other end, it was the others uh, who claimed that no, I mean, uh, the reforms are not producing uh, uh, results and therefore you have the Arab Spring. We spend a lot of time on looking at the facts without any priors or ideologies uh, and the truth is in between. I mean, first, economic reforms had to happen. The old model, the paternalistic model and the giveaway was no longer uh, feasible. Second, the reforms paid had some good results. Uh, they decreased the debt, they decreased inflation, they opened up the economy to some extent. The point, however, is that any kind of reforms, pro-market reforms, when you come from central planning, if you want, <laughs> was going to have some effect. Now, what is the issue then? And the issue is that, yes, we had some effects, but the effects were not as great as they could have been, not the fundamentals of the reforms were such that will enable sustainable growth and picking up by the private sector where the state, uh, the government had, uh, had left it behind. Uh, so yes, there was uh, trade liberalization, but the effects of uh, reducing barriers to trade on the economy, local production and the social sector was not taken into account. In other words, 
the reforms were driven by an untested, if you want, uh, philosophy and theory, and especially in the financial sector. Now, of course, for the financial sector after 2008, nobody would say that the neoliberal approach or whatever it is, the Washington Consensus was correct, but we had to wait until 2008 to stand up and say that, yes, uh, the financial sector needs regulation, so you don't go uncritically in uh, deregulation. Then the region went through privatization, which affected was denationalization. And you can see all this list here that yes, all reforms were required in all these areas, but uh, they were not done well. And as uh, a, a local person told me, at the end, uh, what re reforms benefited was the wife of Ben Ali, the sons of Mubarak, and the in-laws of Assad. <laughs> so in other words, that's where we come down and we conclude with this statement effectively for looking into the future and what needs to be done, that yes, reforms w were required. The way forward is through the uh, private sector, but the private sector should be a true private sector. Could be competitive, could be transparent, could be one that will reward the efforts of young people to come into the labor market and get what they are worth and what skills they bring into, into, the, uh, into the economy. Uh, already you can see that we didn't have any priors uh, and uh, we are kind of wet, if you want, uh, in the assessment. But uh, I would say the important thing we had, and we also took advantage of earlier work from UNDP and the human report, uh, human, chal human uh, development challenges. Uh, the Arab, 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 yeah, human uh, challenges report, human development challenges report, and also the prior work of the ILO. And surprisingly, we used a lot from the World Bank and the and the IMF, uh, right? We interpret it differently, but uh, and we, uh, it fit the story in a way uh, that uh, was not kind of orthodoxy in the 1990s or 2000 by the IFIs, the international financial uh, uh, institutions. Uh, and uh, we said, okay, let's see what the facts show. Let's get the data. And then we come back to theory or to the story. And as we can see, I mean, when we're talking about the Arab world, it's, there are 22 countries. And in fact, the differences between these 22 countries is much bigger than between the average Arab country and the, Arab, uh, the average European country or Asian country. The Arab region is extremely diverse to start with, and you can see the reasons there. The second thing is that uh, it is uh, not well defined when it comes to regions and statistics. For example, you are all familiar with the term MENA, which is the Middle East and North Africa. And in fact, this is a sh short um, term for the, for, the Arab, uh, for the Arab world. However, MENA includes Iran. So if you try to have regional kind of stories and you include Iran with its 80 million people when the Arab world is just over 300 million, automatically you dilute the Arab average by including Iran. And if you have regional statistics on the Middle East and you exclude Egypt and Algeria, Morocco and Libya, the dominance of Iran in the statistics is just phenomenal. Then you have averages for the GCC and they use, as they call, population-weighted uh, averages, which means by including Saudi Arabia in the GCC average in terms of population, you don't have a GCC average, you have a Saudi Arabia average. So we went through this painstake activity uh, to, 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 to purge the influence of Iran from the Arab region, and uh, we used unweighted averages. So if a country had inflation 5% and the other had 10 the average of the two countries was 7.5. Although one could have been Egypt and the other could be Comoros. We're trying to explain country differences and why the countries revolted and revolted at the same time. Not the average, the average what's happening in the average Arab population. We're talking about the average Arab country. So in doing so, and I will present it as myths kind of, uh, for ease of reference so that we remember the numbers and the stories, uh, we dispel a couple of myths that they were published even in 2012. I haven't been following in the last uh, couple of months. But even in 2012, we had uh, in official documents of very big organizations and less academic organizations, for example, that uh, economic growth has been jobless. Also, this was driven from the fact that we have very high unemployment rates. <coughs> and therefore, the Arabs revolted 
because there were no jobs. As you can see, we'll argue that there were a lot of jobs, but they were not so-called decent, and we'll explain that. So here we have the three regions. Uh, uh, why does it? There, right? The Middle East, the North Africa, and the GCC. And here we have all the tigers uh, and, the, f and the lions from, from Asia. This graph shows the response of employment when output increases. When output increases, you should employ more people. So you don't have to have jobless growth. As you can see in the Asian region, for 10% increase in output, the labor force increases only by 30% which is more or less expected if output increases by 10, you don't need as many workers. You have economies of scales, you have improvement technology, you don't need 10% more workers to produce 10% of output. In the development literature, the average elasticity, which is this ratio, is about 3 to 0.3 to 0.4. Now, if you see here, in the regions, in the Arab region, a lot of jobs were created. For every 10% increase in output, on average, you increase 7% uh, the, 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 the labor force. In fact, no Arab country had lower employment response to output increase uh, than the average Asian, uh, Asian response. But this is something that has to be said. If you look what was written even last year, people were referring to jobless growth. So the issue was, let's create jobs. And between us, if it, that was the case, it would have been a good kind of story because, yeah, the economy grows. And uh, if you can produce more with less, I mean, it means you are becoming efficient. As you will see in a minute, the region had the lowest effectively productivity growth <laughs> in the world. <laughs> so it's not creating more jobs, but it's making better use of jobs in production, which is modernizing, having a dynamic private sector that, as I said, the private sector was kind of uh, subject to crony capitalism, as they say. And uh, also, the fewer people work, the more leisure people can have. I mean, uh, work is a curse, I mean, from the very old times. Uh. So the other was that, uh, forget the, whether they found work. Oh, there are too many people, fertility is there, Arab women having children left and right, and all this kind of stuff. Yes, it is true. The, la the, uh, the labor force is increasing as you can see the, the green bars here, but the rate of growth has declined. And this is the important thing, because at the end what matters is the rate of growth of the economy, not by how many people it grow, but what is the rate of growth of the population. So what mitigates uh, population pressure in the economy is the rate of growth of the population, of the working age population, and uh, of, uh, uh, of the labor force. And already from the 2000s, the pressure had gone down. In other words, in 2010, there was less pressure from rising population numbers, if you want, compared to the economy than what you had 10 and 2 years ago. One of the biggest myths, however, is this youth bulge, as they say. And if you are careful and you look at statistics, you never know what this announcements mean when they say, oh, 50% of the population is below that, or 30% or 40. Some refer to children, some refer to youth, some refer to those under 25, some refer to those under 30. So it's just a number that comes out, and it is always big. Okay, it's big, but what does it mean in context? Uh, and when it comes to the too many youth, here it's something that when we were probing the data, it came as a phenomenal surprise to us. The three Arab regions which are in the circle, the Arab world, or the Arabs if you want, were very much the same in 1970, okay? The youth to adult population was 50%, okay? Now, in North Africa is the middle red line and the, popula the, the, the pressure of uh, the youth population in the labor force compared to adult population works started declining from the 1970s. In fact, Morocco achieved a decline in fertility in 30 years that took the West 150 years to do, to go from seven children down to three. And in Morocco did it from the 50s until the 80s. So already this demographic transition has been going on. Okay, the Arab region still grows more than other regions, but fertility has gone down from seven and eight children down to three in North Africa to two. So it's not too many youth. In the Middle East, the top line uh, the transition started from the 1980s. And in the uh, GCC, already they have fewer uh, youth than the world average. And this is the number of youth. 
over time, if you take from this number of youth, the increasing number of youth in the education system, and we have to give it to the Arabs, the, the, the gains in education enrollment have been phenomenal, partly because of increasing rates of enrollment among women, the pressure has been even much less over time <coughs> or from the youth kind of labor force and unemployment upon the labor market. <coughs> so already, I don't know, perhaps I'm creating a straw man and you knew these things so or you say, oh yes, these are obvious, but these are in print up until uh, last year. Then we come to the case of unemployment. It is more mixed. Uh, the unemployment case and of course I mean uh, even in Europe or everywhere some countries unemployment goes up or down but overall unemployment here in the Arab states uh, has declined over time and in fact it has declined more than all the other regions in the, the world which are indicated in green the green numbers here this is uh, East Europe, Latin America, East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and so on so the decline in unemployment in the Arab world, all these 22 Arab countries, has been faster than any other region in the last 20 years. It's not over a year or two. It's 20 years. And this was also somehow missed. Of course, there are some countries where unemployment has increased. The countries to the left of the blue line, these are Arab countries where unemployment increased. But if you see there are two green areas, one referring to the Southeast Asia and the other to the EU and developed economies, the OECD economies. So yes, I mean, when you have 22 Arab countries, in only 16, unemployment went down, right? And in eight went up. So yes, it is a diversified, but this blanket statement that it was jobless growth and unemployment was increasing, it is not there. <laughs> Something that's coming here uh, the square is female unemployment, the blue is male unemployment. As you can see, the squares are usually above the blues. And this is something which is recurrent in our report. A lot of the bad indicators, if not all of the bad indicators in the Arab labor markets is because of the poor position of women in the labor market. So it is a very gender specific, if you want, issue. And this creates questions now. Is it a matter of skills or economic policy that can address that? Or we need to have institutional policies, uh, uh, reforms, uh, uh, changes in legislation, and things uh, that are not usually addressed by policymakers. And you take them I in mean, the uh, institutional environment as, uh, as given. Now, again, harping on the too many unemployed youth, so this is the ratio of female, of youth to adult unemployment. You see, youth unemployment was 150% more than adult unemployment in the 1990s. Now they are on par. In other words, and we'll come to that, the problem of 2010 was not the bad position of the youth. It was the bad position of the adults. It was the middle class that was not getting the benefits of economic growth that the limited economic reforms that we had from the 1990s uh, have created. And it would have been, that's a personal note, would be living in a very nice world if the youth could get to Tahrir Square in the streets and they could change the world. Because they are less corrupt, they still listen to parents and teachers and we don't tell them the bad things we have done. And uh, also, the youth have an interest to live in a better world because they have 50 years to live in that world. If you are 60 or 70 or 80, you don't care to change the world because it will have a cost of change, and second, you don't have a time horizon to reap the benefits. Yeah. Yeah, for your next generation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just to show a point that the youth, I mean, yes, uh, they, they are the thermometer. They show the temperature. But uh, yes, youth unemployment is, is very high. 15, 21, 26 in the GCC, North Africa, and in the Middle East. Uh. And indeed, the ratio of youth to adult unemployment was 150%, 160%. Now, look what happened in here. In the GCC, the youth to adult unemployed went from 160% to 85%. They were half. And so on, 30% in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, saying this again and again because it's important to uh, emphasize that this report is driven by numbers. And then we have the qualitative aspects. For example, why should the, the youth revolt when the unemployment rate is 15% and should not revolt in, in Greece, 
it's 57 percent now. In Spain, it's 56 percent. In fact, in the North Mediterranean, youth unemployment is twice uh, that in North Africa. So it's not just unemployment. The difference between Spain and Italy and uh, Portugal has to do with voice and what other avenues you have to express your discontent with an outcome compared to what you have and what the governments, uh, the governments are doing. Here, I will not spend time. In terms of male unemployment, which is the bars, the uh, Arab men are average compared to the world. The big difference are the black dots here. In the sense, you see, all these greens are male and female unemployment in the non-Arab regions. And you see male and female unemployment is more or less the same, a little bit higher, a little bit lower. The Arab female unemployment are these diamonds up in the sky. So unemployment is very much, the high rates of unemployment is something that relates very much with the position of women. And as I said, this is recurrent in all aspects of uh, the reports that we looked at. Uh, uh, you see the difference between the male and uh, the uh, female unemployment for the subregions that we have, the GCC, the uh, Middle East, and, and North Africa. Very quickly on the economy, we don't have to say much here. That is the Arab Renaissance. The Arab region in the 1990s and 80s, uh, 2000 started increasing. And compared to the zero growth rates they had in the 1980s, it was a renaissance. Two things here. Still, it was less the growth rate in the Arab world than everywhere else, except Latin America, that had its own problems. And this is the growth of the economy. If you factor in the growth in the population, as we will show later on, the gains in uh, incomes per capita were really minuscule. <laughs> in fact, the lowest in the world. And this is very important because that was a period of very high economic growth in the world. When the rest of the world was uh, reaping the benefits of globalization, okay, there was a bubble there up until 2008, but the rest of the world had very high um, uh, growth rates in the 1990s and 2000s. So these were another two lost decade, uh, decades in the Arab world in the context of globalization. And um, uh, uh, let me stop here because time is also running out. So economic growth, I mean, to summarize, yes, it had some effects, but it was this kind of clubby, club privatization, establishment elites, uh, and the, those around the, 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 the power structure that were reaping all the benefits, uh, low returns, but quick personal returns, if you privatize and you nationalize and you go just telecommunications and other trophy projects. And uh, this summarizes, and I will, go, will not go more on that, very quickly, each one of them is explained here. MENA had the lowest investment rates before the reforms and the lowest after. Uh, surprisingly, MENA has one of the highest constraints to land. I mean, you know prices of housing in Beirut. I mean, <laughs> come to the GCC also, but go to the Arab states. Uh, land, uh, somehow it's a feudalistic kind of environment, uh, that there are no clear property rights, and uh, also land is distributed in certain way. So <coughs> there's no investment. Uh, you don't have uh, uh, opportunities in land or building or location of industry. Third here, what this diagram shows is that uh, industry has a small base in the last 20 years, and it increased by 5%. So it was a small sector that increased by 5%, right? I mean, that's why you Arabs export people, right? In Korea, they have a big industry, they export cars. The Arabs don't have an industry, so they export their people. I mean, they emigrate. But the, the services sector, which was big, they increased by a lot. Huh? Now, this has uh, implications later on for productivity, but did the economic reforms lead to greater competition? Uh, the answer is no. As you can see, in the world, with the exception of Africa, uh, there are no new entry of firms in the Arab world compared to other regions, which is particularly interesting in an era of globalization and fast change. So you come to company creation, entry of new firms and ideas and innovation, the Arab region in the last 20 years remained as low as uh, it was before. Uh, median age of manufacturing firms, it's uh, again the same. 
constraints. The constraints they have in their region are institutional constraints. They have to do with stability, with informality, with corruption, access to land, as I mentioned. Uh, it has been a constrained uh, economy, private sector. And that's why we say, yes, the reforms did some things in the private sector. They show, they indicate the capacity, to, the, the possibility of having uh, uh, great gains if we continue with economic reforms, but genuine economic reforms, not the kind of reforms of denationalization that we had before. I want you to pay some attention to the skills. Skills comes very low into the preferences of the, uh, into, into what the private sector thinks that it is a constraint. Uh, Low productivity growth, no surprise after all the things I told you that the region had the lowest uh, productivity growth. And this is a very important um, uh, diagram which summarizes the, the section on the economy. What it shows is over time productivity increases. For example, in Anastasia increased there by 5% per year. The red line, the red bar here, shows how much productivity increased because say the textiles workers are more productive than last year because of technology or know-how, whatever. The blue line is how much productivity increased because workers moved from low productivity to high productivity sectors. For example, they moved from textiles to cars, okay, or from agriculture to manufacturing. Now, if you see, the Arab region is unique. The only one that has the blue part underneath, which means the movement of workers between sectors, it was from high productivity to low productivity sectors. I mean, this is economic uh, disaster. And in fact, paves the way to show what this means for decent employment. What this diagram shows is instead of the Arab countries to be up and down this uh, uh, regression line, all the Arab countries have in agriculture more workers than they should given their level of development. So all the Arab countries have been developing and they are middle income or whatever it is, still they have a lot of workers in the informal sector, in agriculture. So this of course constrains the potential for, uh, uh, for growth and also the impact on the social sectors. So this is uh, actually a diagram from Carnegie, uh, from <laughs> uh, and uh, we have it in the report, huh? and says, yes, employment was created. You remember, we said employment uh, uh, growth was not jobless, but created. But if you see, for example, in Algeria, for every point reduction in unemployment, the blue line, the share of informal employment increased by exactly the same amount. So yes, the people were employed, but not in, uh, in good jobs. Uh, the GCC is a group of their own in terms of uh, employment creation. What we have here is an index of how many nationals were in the 1975 and how many there are today. And all this change, the downward trend, is because jobs do not go to nationals. You hire people at a fraction of the wage from another country. The only exception is Kuwait that put a stop after 1990s the graph is from 1975, given I mean, the um, uh, Iraq invasion and the uh, change in approach to the use uh, of nationals. So yes, if you have an open door policy and you're allowing your country, to people to come and work for a tenth of the fraction of that the people, your nationals want to work, uh, unavoidably, then uh, you dilute their wages and conditions of employment. Uh, but it's not just the GCC. This is the case of Jordan, a par excellence labor exporting country, skilled labor also, right? And if you see the private sector in the golden years of Jordan growth in the 2000, the private sector created 190,000 190, jobs for Jordanians and 225,000 jobs for uh, migrant workers. So even a poor country that exports labor and qualified labor that has the opportunity to go to a high wage equilibrium and good working conditions, they open up the border. It helps a few investors who have the qualified industrial zones and export manufacturing, but this has been short lived and did not have a, uh, an impact on the Jordanians who still have to emigrate. Uh, now, in education and skills, a lot have been said, and the LCPS has published. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
we have skills mismatches and skill shortages in the Arab world. I mean, what I will say is that uh, uh, educated Arabs are unemployed in their country. If they are employed, they have very low wage premium, which means the extra years they spend in the university and the 50,000 at AUB does not pay. And if they don't find an employment uh, locally, they emigrate. And they don't emigrate to any country. They emigrate to France, to Australia, to Canada, to America. So these people have the skills to compete in the most challenging economies, but uh, they don't have skills for this kind of uh, uh, technologies that are used in their countries. So there can be something else there. The World Economic Forum had a survey of employers, and guess what? The best systems of training are in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. And 12% of them uh, or more, 14%, for example, in uh, Switzerland, said we can't find the skills we want, which is understandable. These economies are at the cutting edge of technology, and technology is moving faster than adjusting the curriculum at the education system. So that's why they train a lot, and they have good training systems, right? Now, surprisingly, in the GCC, where there are five migrant workers we can import from everywhere at a fraction of the price, we say we don't have skills, right? And uh, the point is, yes, they don't have skills because they don't want to have skills. They employ low-skilled labor at very low wages, labor-intensive techniques. And of course, the story is that in Lebanon, uh, you have a lot of, uh, uh, of excess supply of skilled workers, and therefore, uh, unsurprisingly, Lebanon comes with a uh, list constraints for uh, uh, employers to have skills. Of course, another thing to look at it is if there were demand for skills, the firms would provide training. How, what do you do? If you don't stop production, if you don't find an input or a material or, uh, or something that you need, you get it. Well, that's the story of the Middle East. They don't train. We live in economies that have excess labor supply, educated supply. And this is what was not finding an outlet before the Arab, uh, the Arab Spring. Um, so I don't want to say that um, everything is rosy in education. The quality of education is still very low, adequate for production, but in terms of academic achievement, very low. Inequality of opportunity as measured in the school tests of kids from rich and poor families is one of the greatest in the region. And you have it even in Lebanon. I would say 50% of the Lebanese go to the best universities and private education. The other 50% do not even finish uh, uh, high school. And there is definitely an area where education can improve. This graph here shows that the education of managers in the, uh, uh, in the Arab world is least compared to one other regions. So definitely we need more education. So let me just move to the final section from my part, which is the political economy side. And in between, we should have inserted Halit's presentation. But uh, let me go on this one so we don't go back and forth. So we arrive in 2010 with the Arab region having the lowest uh, public accountability. In fact, one question is of the 22 countries, not that democracy is a panacea, but how many had free elections? Let's think about that, right? <laughs> of the 22 Arab countries, how many had free elections? Moreover, the index of voice and accountability, and uh, many of them, uh, we have them in the report, has been declining over, over time. So there was dissatisfaction with citizens' inability to express their voice and how the government was responding to that. What was the result? This is a graph of the uh, public protests in North Africa. All right. What is important is that they were suppressed. Once they started in 96, by 2000 they went down. 2001, by 2005 they were suppressed. 2006, by 2009, 10 they were suppressed. But what is important is after the suppression, the stars indicate the protests were coming up at a higher level and they were suppressed. And they were at a higher level and they were suppressed, never returning to the original level. And of course, 2011, is what happened. Citizens' pessimism was on the rise. Here we have all the regions of the world, how they felt in 2006 and 2008. Again, the MENA region stands out. It's the only one where the people felt worse in 2010 than in 2006. 
In all cases, the, the diamond is within the bar, which means in 2010 they were more optimistic about their prospects. Uh, while in the MENA region, between 2006 and 2010, something has been happening. <coughs> okay? And this, I close with this uh, diagram here, which I think summarizes everything we said, and it is uh, an accidental diagram. It was like Fleming's discovery or invention of the penicillin. He accidentally left the room, closed, and the following morning when he went back, uh, he had found, I mean, all the substances that save uh, uh, thousands and millions of, uh, of the world. Uh, uh, we had some data uh, from the World Bank and the IMF. One was on accountability, the other was on income growth. And we plot plotted all the world countries of the world in this diagram. Okay? So, here we have voice. You want to be here on the right. Lots of voice, you can express it, and the governments are accountable. There we have per capita income growth, not growth of the economy, per capita income growth. How much citizens were becoming richer individually over time, not the economy. Okay, and you will see how much the wealth was appropriated by the people and the investors over time. So you want to be up there in the corner, all right? Well, okay, I mean, you can be there. You be can be China. Okay, you have very high growth, no accountability. Uh, let's be clear here. We are talking in the report about the merit of voice, accountability, and social dialogue. We don't specify what it should be. Let me give you an example here. Last week, China announced he will put a lot of money on agricultural development, expanding health services, and increasing minimum wages. Right? They don't have democracy, but this is what people want. Okay, this is accountable government. Singapore, I mean, <laughs> it's another country, <laughs> right? <laughs> but they are accountable. They may not have the kind of elections or ballots or whatever it is, but there is accountability. So in this diagram, yes, you can be China, you can be India. In fact, you, it's not bad to be here and have very low growth. Switzerland, Finland, uh, Luxembourg, uh, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. You see, they, these are the most voice and account, the most loud and accountable countries. They have very low growth here. Uh, they had it in the past, right? That's why they <laughs> industrialized, right? Now, the interesting thing here is you don't want to be in that quadrant, the south, <laughs> south, uh, southwest, correct? Uh, especially, you don't want to be to the left of that quadrant. <laughs> you see what countries you have there? Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Syria, and another one. Okay? You should mention so this before the revolution. I, it did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was accidental. <laughs> okay, uh, let me stop here, which I think summarizes the dynamics of economic reforms and how we got in 2010. And effectively, we say yes, now what is needed is sound economic policies. At the same time, however, you must have social dialogue. <laughs> and of course, make sure that the benefits of growth are distributed more equally, something that my colleague uh, will talk uh, in this uh, uh, next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I must admit that uh, always the virus um, has that ability to sort of convincingly, convincingly uh, challenge the conventional wisdom and also, even as I regard uh, myself as a tough moderator, I couldn't stop him, actually, because <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's an interesting story, an interesting story, and uh, supported and substantiated by all these figures. Let me just uh, mention that we have a copy of the report available uh, on just your left-hand side, and there are some folders where you have the executive summary in both Arabic and English, and the report is going to be posted on the ILO. Uh, the regional office. I, uh, while they're changing, switching chairs, I also want to mention that if you have any questions about, you know, where we're taking this report in the future, we have with us Ms. Nadan Nashif, the uh, regional director for the uh, ILO office here in Beirut, uh, and uh, we might engage here in our discussions uh, just to see where we're going and heading. But uh, now we'll uh, move on and talk about the quality of this growth and who have benefited from this with uh, Khaled Ousmane. Thanks, uh, Ibrahim. I think it's uh, difficult to... Uh, <laughs> 
talk after um, Zafiris's very comprehensive uh, presentation because he really said it all. Um, but um, let me try to summarize uh, the story from perhaps a different uh, angle. The, um, the story I think the report is trying to, s to say, and it was also said previously in the UNDP Arab Development Challenges report, which, by the way, uh, adopts the conventional uh, weighting approach. So even if you were to not use a simplified uh, average and weight uh, countries by population and, and, and give the more statistically accurate figures, you would reach exactly the same conclusions. But of course, as Afir said, the purpose was not to, to highlight or to, to highlight what the average Arab uh, country has, has done. But really the story is we have a mixed record on growth. Um, we so, so when it comes to when it comes to judging economic growth, yes, we had some um, a, a, an a episode of high economic growth during the particularly during the 2000-2010. Uh, a lot of jobs were created. In fact, we were the fastest region in the world in terms of pro providing jobs, mm, faster than any other developing region. So these are facts. But as we shall see, the jobs were not going to the right sectors, where it, the value added was high or where we want to uh, be engaged in, 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 in economically. Overall growth rates were pretty decent, but when you factor in population growth, uh, then you can see that we were below uh, where we would like to be. So essentially there was, uh, there were, there was growth, there were jobs, but as we shall see, they were not uh, decent in nature. They were the, the quality of jobs were not, uh, were, were not up to par with our expectations. Likewise, the story uh, on poverty. There was poverty reduction, at least up until 2010. Um, but it was not what, what the people had expected, especially when you have GDP growth rates of 5% uh, and above. I mean, if I'm reading the newspaper and I'm looking at this year after year, we're, uh, you know, the Egyptian economy is growing by 5 or 6%, and I know that on average, the average Egyptian household has witnessed very little growth uh, in, in real uh, per capita expenditure, therefore poverty actually increased alongside economic growth, then there's a very uh, good reason for, for public protest. On the social side, in general, however, I would say that Arab countries were a success and the human development indicators would, would, would <coughs> verify that. So you did have a growth process with problems, you did have social indicators with some degree uh, of success, but problems with social protection, again, a mixed record. Uh, but where we had a glaring failure was on the governance part. So on the governance indicators, as yes, this is really where the problem was. So I think with that basic summary of, uh, uh, of you know, the, the main, the main storyline, let me get into a few more uh, data-oriented uh, uh, figures here and, and talk a little bit more about this growth, employment, poverty, uh, human development nexus. Now, if you look at actually the wage share uh, for the Arab region, you can see that uh, it has been going down faster than any other region in the world. Now, this doesn't really say much about the real wages per person. They could have been constant or even increasing, but the wage share itself uh, if in, in terms of GDP has been going down. That basically means that the, the share of growth that was appropriated by workers was not uh, uh, increasing. In fact, it was, it was actually uh, declining. Also, a measure, a good measure of uh, uh, the kind of growth and the impact it had on workers is the social, uh, uh, the level of, of social protection measured here by the percentage of informal workers who are covered by social protection. Look at where the uh, Arab countries are compared to even Africa and uh, Latin America and, and other regions. We are the lowest in, in terms of, uh, of of coverage. Again, I'm going to rush through this because I know I, I just want to give the stylized facts before going into the concluding, um, you know, uh, 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 the storytelling part. Before the Arab um, uh, 
um, spring, before the financial crisis, very few countries actually provided unemployment benefits. You can again see here, um, it's a self-explanatory graph compared to other developing regions. Uh, unemployment rates in the region, actually one of the characteristics is that it's not really a function of whether you're rich or, or poor. You can see that in other uh, regions, if you are poor, you're expected to be unemployed. If you're rich, richer, you're expected to be um, employed. In the Arab region, that's not the case. Okay, so that's another important thing to say. Now let's look a little bit about the poverty uh, story and, and how uh, it has unfolded in the region. Of course, one has to start by saying measuring poverty in itself is problematic. But there has been, uh, um, regardless of the poverty line that you use. There has been poverty reduction in the regions if we take 1990 as a base year, uh, up until 2010. The latest figures we are actually developing for the Arab MDG report show a reversal of trend. But as far as this report is concerned, up until 2010, if we use the $2 a day, and the reason why we're choosing the $2 a day is because it's close to the average of the national poverty lines of most Arab countries, you will see that there was poverty reduction. Not significant, not at the same pace of the growth of GDP, but there was, in general, poverty uh, reduction. Likewise, you can see that the share of the working poor uh, has been relatively low in the Arab region compared to other regions, but it's been declining slowly. So basically, you have had a poverty impact, but it was more of a muted impact. I mean, that's that's the story that we have so far. Again, vulnerable employment uh, uh, as a percentage of total employment, and you can see the, the change for the Arab region. It's been going down, but also it's not as high as in other regions. These, are again, are uh, the, the stylized facts. What we can say about vulnerable employment, though, as in the case of um, employment uh, indicators, is that it's also gender-specific. This does not apply to Arab women, where the ratio of vulnerable employment is extremely uh, high compared to other regions. Now let's look at the inequality story. This growth uh, that we've been talking about, the growth process, has it been broad-based? Well, if you look at the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of uh, from zero to one of, of how equal uh, or unequal the growth process was, if you know, if, if, if you have a very high Gini, it means it's very, uh, uh, very unequal. We, we have a story telling us that actually inequality in the region was stagnating. And not only that, Arab countries have low to medium inequality in general. Um, does this make sense? Actually, it's, it does and it doesn't. Empirically, this is correct. But we know, um, as a matter of fact, that the Arab countries the surveys do not really capture the income of the very rich. Now, somebody may say, well, that's also the case in Latin America, that's also the case elsewhere. But in, we can argue that in this region, it hasn't captured more the, uh, the, the affluence of the, the richest classes. And the reason why we, we know that is because the differences between the growth rate of the private consumption expenditure and the, the economy as a whole uh, is, is greatest. So compared to other regions, basically the unaccounted for growth is higher in this, in this region. Um, you can, another way to tell you that story is basically to look at the household private consumption as a share of GDP and you can see that it has actually been uh, uh, declining. Now, what we're trying to say basically here is that whilst the economies were growing at a rate of 5 or 6 percent, the surveys that we actually do, and when we go and ask people, you know, how much are you spending, and we look at the growth rates from these household income and expenditure surveys, we find that there's probably very little growth at all, hence the very low poverty reduction impact that we, that we have seen. So basically the story on an inequality is that it's uh, probably a lot more significant than we actually think. Uh, in fact, we did an exercise. If we take half of this unaccounted for uh, uh, difference between national accounts and between the surveys and we give it to the 5% the top 5%, our genies would actually jump to rates closest to closer to Latin America. But that's another uh, exercise. 
Now, the human development story. What I guess we're trying to say here is um, is that. This, these figures are trying to basically measure the gap between Arab countries and the uh, highest developing, uh, developed economies, the OECD average economies. And you can see here that uh, the uh, difference in between the periods 1970 to 2010 um, uh, and 1990 to 2010, you can see that the uh, closing the gap, which is basically that uh, uh, graph that you have on, 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 on the right-hand side, was much higher if you take 1970 as a base year. In 1970, most of the Arab economies were still relatively uh, poor. They basically had uh, very low human development indicators, health education uh, indicators. Even per capita GDP was, was quite low. So it was easy to close the gap in a way. Um, moving on to 1990, however, um, from if you take 1990 as, as a base year, there was still there was still progress in close, closing that gap, but it was far less than uh, what was achieved earlier. Still, and this was noted in the Global Human Development Report of UNDP, five out of the ten fastest. Um, if you will, developing economies in terms of closing that gap or in terms of progressing on human development were from this region. And the number one economy, Arab economy, was Oman, and number two or three was uh, Tunisia, Saudi Arabia. So one has to really acknowledge these stylized facts, is that in terms of human development, the Arab region if from 1970 to, uh, to, 90 to 2010 was, there were many success successes. However, if you take 1990 as a base here, this, the story uh, changes to some extent. Uh, still, despite this progress, still, if you were to look today at the Human Development Index of Arab countries, compare it with the expected Human Development Index, given its level of income, we'll see that most Arab countries uh, are actually below that. So again, even despite this quantum leap that we, we say that we've achieved, uh, we're still below where uh, we're supposed to be compared to our level of income. Now, the final section of, of the presentation. Let's look a little bit about the context, the, the future context that we're facing. Clearly, after the Arab Spring, the region as a whole is expecting lower uh, growth projections. These are the IMF uh, projections that we're expecting from 2011 to 2015. And we have a lot of challenges. We have 34% youth inactivity rate. We have a, a female labor pr uh, force participation rate, which is extremely low. And despite the, the, ch the decline in unemployment, unemployment has definitely increased in, in 2010. Our own estimates of, of are actually close to around five. And here I'm talking about the ESQA estimates, because we're working on our close to five million additional unemployed uh, in, in two, since 2010. So it's, it, it's actually. Um, going to be quite a challenge to address uh, the employment and decent work related issues because the context has changed. Taking into account that it's not easy to do that. If you actually look at uh, countries that have been through crises in the past and you look at the, uh, the average amount of time it took for them to, re to go back to their pre-crisis uh, uh, um, unemployment level, you see that on average even the ones that went back to their pre-crisis uh, uh, unemployment rates, it took around 11 years. In, in some cases, in some other uh, economies, it took uh, almost 17 years. The countries are here on the graph. I mean, it, it took, for example, Greece in, uh, to recover from 1992 crisis, it took it more than se almost 17 years in, in the first uh, graph. It took Spain uh, almost 20 plus years to, to recover. So, essentially, there's also, in, in, in addition, there's a whole process of development transformation that we really uh, should be talking about. That is, the structure of an economy, the structure of the labor market itself changes as the economy changes. And what we want to see is a, an economy where you have this inverted pyramid, where you have a large proportion of the labor force is highly skilled and a smaller proportion uh, uh, being devoted to the unskilled labor. Now, of course, the traditional economies that we have are more like the first pyramid that we see. It takes almost 30 years to do this development transformation. So it's, these are some of the challenges that we are facing. 
Um, and, and, and it's important that we realize the order of magnitude of this challenge, these challenges so that we can then talk and address uh, the, you know, the, the whole gamut of policies required in order for us to do this shift in uh, economic policy and social policy as well. So let's summarize, and this will be my uh, last slide. Growth has been slower uh, than other developing regions, but it picked up after 2000. It was focused more on low value added uh, sectors and activities. So uh, you can see the sharp increase in informal uh, uh, activities. And it was not matched with rising real wages or uh, with poverty uh, reduction in, in general. Um, and uh, that's one side of the story. There was progress on the, on the social side. There was certainly progress in, in human capital base. The human capital base that you had in the Arab region in 2010 was certainly much uh, higher, much you know, uh, more qualified and had higher aspirations than the one that you had in 1990 or, or in the 70s. So with these higher aspirations, particularly of the youth, not be having the appropriate vent in, um, in economic institutions and labor markets, you really had all the ingredients for public uh, protests and public contestations as we have seen. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you, thank you, uh, Well, clearly, if we just remember the last uh, graph presented by the virus and the conclusion here, uh, to overcome the challenges, it takes time. And this is, you know, I think patience is becoming a very uh, sort of precious during this time of transition that the Arab countries is going through. But I leave the... Um, to uh, the comments uh, and the, the conclusion and what uh, ever out of this to Sami who is going to provide the comments on this. Please, Sami. Um, thank you, Ibrahim. And obviously, uh, thank you, Zafiris and Khaled for a wonderful presentation and a wonderful report. I remember when I uh, received um, this report when it came out, I remember just like going very, very quickly, going over it very quickly. Um, I was like, oh wow, this is really a report worth reading just by looking at the graphs, frankly. Um, so thanks, Nada, for sending it. So, but when when Brahim called to ask me to be here, then I really had to read it. So, so thank you, Brahim, for <laughs> for forcing me to to read it. But it was really um, a pleasure reading it, and I really encourage anyone who is interested in economic reforms or planning to do work on economic reforms, you really cannot not read it. Um, and I'll mention a few reasons why is this. So what I'm going to talk about, just to give you a sense of my presentation, I'm going to say or try to answer three questions. Why I like this report, what I would have liked to see in the report, and where do we go from here. So um, on why I like the report is definitely timely. It definitely addresses issues that we or that have been sort of hidden or not talked about explicitly. If growth and when growth was discussed, it was always seen particularly by international organizations from the private sector perspective by developing and thinking about investment climate. This report goes away from that and really puts the citizen at the core of the debate. So looking at social protection, looking at quality of jobs, and these are labor union even, I think these are definitely worth looking at and examining. Two, um, the authors don't shy away from uh, bringing in the politics every now and then into the story or uh, sort of maybe hinting why certain policies were adopted in terms of, or for instance, overvalued exchange rates. They tell you this is, was to serve or help the importers who were closely connected to the political elite. Um, or they talk about how credit or access to credit and finance served also a very small circles close to, to, to political leaders. Um, even the policy making process, they sort of even hint at one point that the policy making process is really captured by the very, very few. And I'm hinting or highlighting these, even though the presentation didn't really, didn't really address them, but I think they're relevant to my question three at the end. Um, the third reason why I like it, besides being timely and bringing the politics in, is dispelling the myth. And this is why I really think it's worth reading. From the youth bulge, as Zafiris mentioned, the jobless growth, 
uh, lack of entrepreneurship. It was interesting that um, people found for, you know, why they're not embarking on entrepreneurship was for social reasons. Uh, you know, I would have thought maybe regulatory reasons, but no. And this is really worth exploring and re worth investigating. Um, private sector, you know, not demanding um, skilled labor. That's really, I find, worth really going deeper into this. Um, the perception of inequalities as well. Uh, another one, the education of managers. How the MENA region has one of the lowest education uh, of, of managers. So let's really also highlight these issues. And it also does a, an interesting job in sort of linking the macro and the micro. You know, and they sort of tell you, okay, so this is it. You know, high growth, but you have low per capita growth. How the wage share, as Khaled just showed us, in terms of getting less, less and less of the earnings, and showing even sort of the high household consumption declining. So it's sort of like nice, sort of a puts it together. And obviously, we really appreciate um, what the authors and the team have gone through in terms of the measurement, the estimation. And this is this is hard work and tedious in many many times. But really, without it, you know, it's, we cannot do anything. That's why, again, I emphasize that you read it. What I would have liked to see in the report, and let me go to my question too, um, more analysis in terms of why do we observe what, what we observe. And it keeps me teased in terms of trying to really understand, although it has done such a good job in describing and, 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 and deconstructing the myth of jobless growth, the employment, you know, it, it leaves me just like wanting to, mo to know more about this. And this what I find um, in some instances uh, needing a sort of a framework that sort of brings uh, some other issues. I mean, they hint sometimes, for example, access to land being a constraint. Now, how is that playing out in my story, in terms of the growth story? Uh, it's not very clear to me. Um, as I mentioned earlier, why entrepreneurship um, in this region um, is not desired? This is worth exploring. Now, whether it's their mandate or they're interested in exploring this, I don't know. But as a reader, and as a researcher in this, you know, I'm left, uh, um, l left hanging or, or maybe, maybe pushing me to even try to answer these questions. You know, maybe it wasn't meant for you to answer them. Uh, but also let me think of um, sort of if we uh, cast a wider, neck, wider uh, net in terms of the framework, in terms of jobs or looking for jobs, does politics play a role? Do political connections play a role? Do we just look at getting a job simply from the private sector perspective in terms of there's no demand for skilled labor, or is it simply about the level of skills and education of uh, the labor supply? Is there no role or is there a role for the use and being politically connected and finding a job in the private sector I'm talking here? So just to... Uh, because we're seeing some real, potentially some relationship here and we're still, at least from our work, trying to figure out what's really the, the, the relationship. Same with migration, and I think uh, they make a good case about why we need to think of migration, migration management. Um, and I'd also want to sort of link migration to industrial policy. Do we see the migrants who return back to their home countries, do we see or observe um, any relationship in terms of setting up firms in the industrial sector. And when I'm throwing this, I'm not really throwing it out of my head just, just like that. And actually, this is part of some of the work we're doing. We, we actually realized that there might be some connection in Lebanon per se that new products discovered, meaning exported in Lebanon, have a relationship to the migrants who returned back in between 2000 and 2008. You know I mean? Is there a relationship here or not? So th these are just sort of, you know, open up the, the, the debate. And, um, and I wish sort of we had the sort of framework to see and assess this because without it, we really can't uh, tell. Also, um, on the issue of the analysis, would have been really nice to know why the Arab countries have been classified as such. We've seen several or at least two or three different classifications. For example, they bring in or they put Yemen with the Levant. Um, and then uh, I think Algeria, Libya, and Egypt and others, Tunisia are together. 
Is there a case whereby you would put Algeria and Libya with the GCC because they're oil? I don't know. I mean, I'd like to hear sort of what really uh, was the driving force for the classifications uh, and to understand better the variations within the Arab world. Um, also, when you compare, I would have liked to see, um, for example, comparing Arab oil against um, non-Arab oil. That would have been sort of the relevant comparator. You know what I mean? Versus, I mean, now I know you've have different regions in the world and so forth, but just to be sort of, you know, neater about this, you know what I mean, this is the right compar comparison I find. And similarly, I would find maybe, I would have grouped, for example, um, uh, Sudan, Mauritania, Djibouti, Somalia, um, uh, even Yemen, in fact, you know, uh, and compare them to Sub-Saharan Africa, you know what I mean, because they look much more of a Sub-Saharan nature than others. But again, I'd, I'd, I'd leave it to the authors to tell us, um, as for, um, I guess the, the last question I have is where do we go from here? And they have posed a number of general and specific uh, policy recommendations. Um, in general, I don't have an issue with them. Maybe I would have liked to see something more sectoral uh, since macro is, is good and is a prerequisite but might not be sufficient. Uh, but then we need go into the debate of the sectoral uh, p policies. Um, but the more sort of important, I think, just to, to, to wrap up my, my points and open up the discussion, is how do we get these policies, as they are, adopted? And how do we make sure that the current regimes and political parties don't end up doing what their predecessors did now? That's really the big question. Are they going to create the same rents or create new rents? Are they going to fa favor their cronies? And why not? That's very likely to happen. One thing we know, just before we sort of dig deeper into this, that countries whose leaders actually depend on a larger coalition, that means they need the support of a larger portion of society, tend to give service better services than those that have or rely on a smaller coalition which effectively says that those who rely on the larger population they need to give them services they need to give them jobs to remain in power now so they're not necessarily civic minded or nice or have goodwill no 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 i think it's really pure political calculation the more jobs i give I'm more likely to get, get, I would more likely be elected. It's a simple calculation. And so now we bring this to the Middle East whereby we're seeing a new sort of, um, not to romanticize, but at least elections are more competitive than ever, at least in, in some countries. We see new political parties taking power. Now, are these political parties going to hijack and rely on a smaller coalition to remain in power or are they going to be forced to give a bigger um, or a larger set of services to their constituents to remain and here to when we think about this and we think about politicians with that framework in mind that means they have they are in power and they want to remain in power and they want to benefit their cronies to remain in power. The more they are exposed to elections or exposed to um, a larger coalition, the more of the goods they have to distribute to a, 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 a larger segment of society. So how do we, in fact, I think the biggest challenge is to align the incentives of the politicians with the incentives of the population. And this is where, the, given that the institutions in the Arab world are maybe, I would say, more malleable than ever, at least in the last 50 years, this is a time where institutional arrangements are being reformed, constitutions are being written, electoral laws, which are very important, not for political representations only. It's very important for development. Because if politicians don't find an incentive to, fi to provide goods and services to people, for example, in rural areas because they, are, they don't vote, you know what I mean, or because we have a majori majoritarian system where they can win the elections at a share of the, as a smaller share of the electorate, then be it, they would love it, in fact, so by not providing. So how do we enlarge this to make sure that better, more jobs, better education, better <laughs> social protection are actually um, 
provided. And obviously, digging deeper, I think it would be really nice to think about the policy making process, which the report also hints at, that it's been captured by the very, very few elite. How do we sort of open it up and ensure that's actually more representative, we have more committed and credible policies? In a nutshell, I guess think th since the report is attempting to think or come up with a new development paradigm, can we really actually have a new development paradigm with it without bringing the politics and the institutions into our framework? On this note, I'll end so we can actually get, get the audience to actually ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Sami, for uh, this um, um, this comments on, on which you're linking um, also the uh, economic realities with the sort of the governing political framework, which actually um, I would say untraditionally this report has fairly alluded to when it uh, talks about the governance and uh, the graph on the governance and growth presented, I think, uh, sort of uh, part of that picture. <coughs> Before I open the floor and um, I just wanted to mention one difficulty uh, as I was reading this report is uh, how to square uh, now uh, creating an enabling environment in, uh, to uh, 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 or enabling environment for long term growth <coughs> while we're going or some countries are going through this really difficult and challenging time and with most of the policies now are sort of uh, populists responding to demand at the street level or what they call now the streets politics is sort of dominating the scene so you need a, a kind of uh, this immediate policy that can deliver and also not to compromise the long term challenges that is facing you uh, we identified the difficulties we just uh, sort of uh, also deconstructed some of the myths but this is where Practically, when you want to move ahead with this, uh, is something that is really challenging, uh, to which I must admit, you know, this is something that also at Carnegie we are struggling with. How can we suggest something that can have an immediate effect, given that there are some structural deficiencies in uh, many of the Arab economies that we are um, addressing in that regard? Well, um, thanks for all the speakers, the discussion. Thank you you for being with us and um, again probably this would um, uh, open the discussion for you know how we are going to formulate our uh, future policies and even now as we're discussing what it's meant by inclusive growth etc just let me remind you that the word bank the IMF now are actually using these words in its literature which if we compare it to like 15 years ago that is a kind of taboo words to be used you know there was like market functioning at their delivers now we are into uh, sort of a new uh, era in, in debating in the Arab countries there are a lot of things that is, uh, are happening but the probably the hard fact is just what has been is that countries in transition they have high probability as a result of this what they call shock effects so unfortunately they will go down before they start picking up, you know, and reaching a uh, kind of consensus. This is what we're witnessing, at least in Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, but uh, we'll keep looking, examining this issue. Thank you for being with us and thank for the...